Last week I mentioned of our lectureship, the theme being that it is dealing with the Holy Spirit and fatal error. And I thought it would be good beginning last week to just have a general study of the Holy Spirit. And so last week we developed the idea of the Holy Spirit is God and notice proofs that He is deity. Today I would like to deal with the Holy Spirit's work with the apostles of Jesus Christ. We've been emphasizing quite a bit uh, on Sunday morning that the apostles of Christ, apostle meaning one chosen and sent out on a specific work, are the ambassadors of the court of heaven to the realm of men on earth. And they had to be enabled to be able to be the spokesman for Christ because by their mere human powers they couldn't do that. And so the Holy Spirit is the one who enables them to be able to do that. I would like to develop that this afternoon. In interpreting the scripture, attention should be paid not only to the speaker and his message, but also to the parties that are addressed addressed by the speaker. There are passages as you read your Bible, and this is general interpretation of the scripture as far as principles of how to do it, Passages that you have in your Bible that are universal in application. There are others that are national and still others that are addressed to individuals only. There are many promises that are addressed to the children of God only. And they don't apply to those who are not citizens of Christ's kingdom or children of God. Again... There are commands that are addressed solely to men in a state of condemnation and have no relevancy when applied to the children of God. Christ uttered many things to His chosen ambassadors, His apostles, and uh, that's because they were chosen to establish His kingdom on earth. They had a Herculean task to say the least. And these things that he said to them were never intended to be applied to any others. I think it's a grievous mistake for the Christian of today to make promises universal when our Lord never intended them to be universal. That they were intended by our Lord to special individuals to accomplish the work that they needed to do. I think it confuses the whole revelation of God's Word in imparting to us the scheme of redemption. And it makes a mystery out of scriptures that otherwise are perfectly clear and when proper limitations at least are, are taken in consideration such as I've been talking about. Things addressed to a chosen few at times have been wrongly applied to all And that causes great confusion as to what the Bible means on certain topics. So it's my purpose in this sermon to notice some of these. Now, if you're going to see where the Lord says the most specifically to the apostles regarding their work as apostles and to nobody else, you need to look at John chapters 14, 15, and 16. These contain a record of an intimate, personal private talk by Jesus to his 12 apostles and to them alone. Now you know that at this time our Lord was approaching the end of his earthly ministry. And as we've said no, numerous occasions, he had chosen his apostles to do a certain work that only they were chosen to do. And they had left everything of this world that would hinder them to follow him. He had accompanied with them and all that that meant for around three and a half years. He had taught them the great truths on which his uh, kingdom, his family, his church, his spiritual body would be founded. They had learned to truly depend upon him for about everything for all their instruction, for their leading and guiding spiritually, for, for advice, for comfort, for strengthening, for guidance, even for correction and rebuke. They confessed this really when they said to him at one time, Thou hast the words of everlasting or eternal life. 
And that's when he asked, after he had taught a hard saying and many had turned away from him, will you also go away? And this indicated their complete reliance upon Jesus. Well, he was soon to leave them. And to say the least, they would feel deserted. We might say sheep without a shepherd. So he wants them to know that they're not going to be left alone. They're not going to be orphaned, as it were. And so he tells them that I will pray the Father, and he shall give you, and this next word is highly significant in our study, he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Now I remind you, this is not said to the church in general. Who's speaking? Jesus. To whom is he speaking? The apostles. Regarding what? Their work after he left. So he's talking about the relationship of the third person of the Godhead with them, giving them what they need to be able to do the work he called them to do. And it would last them as long as they would be able to do that work. As long as they would need him. Now the Greek word translated forever doesn't necessarily mean unlimited duration. It's often applied to much shorter periods. It's even used to apply to the period of time the law of Moses would be for the children of Israel. It can even be used to a lifetime. This will be this you'll be doing as long as you're there to do it. Well, that's forever as far as you're concerned, uh, to use it in modern parlance. Now, the word comforter is translate uh, an effort to translate. Let me put it that way. An effort to translate the Greek word parakletos. And I must say, it is an adequate translation. It's inadequate, inadequate because no one word in the English language can fully translate the relationship the Holy Spirit would have with the apostles of Christ that is caught up in the meaning of the word parakletos. There's just no word within any of the English language that would do that. Some have said, and I tend to agree with them, that it's better to anglicize the word into the English paraclete. So wherever you see comforter used to mean the Holy Spirit's work with the apostles, you might just put in there paraclete and look up the word and know that it's far more than a comforter. Comforter is just one aspect of the relationship the Holy Spirit had with the apostles. This particular word used of the Holy Spirit is used of the Holy Spirit only about four times in the New Testament. And it's only used by Jesus. And it's only used by Jesus in his private address to the twelve apostles. And it's found in these three chapters of John. John 14, 15, and 16. It's never, let me underscore that. It is never applied to the work of the Holy Spirit in relation to mankind in general. It is promised only to the chosen, the twelve. And Jesus plainly says, the world cannot receive him. And remember, we learned last week that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. First, second, and third person. One God in three persons because they all have the same essence. Thus, they all have the same attributes. That may be very difficult to understand. But it's the fact of the matter. I can accept a fact even when I can't fully understand it with the mind God gave me at this time. Now, this paraclete is a distinct gift, I say again, to the apostles. To enable them to do the work God called them to do. He does it because he's taking the place of the personal presence and guidance of their leader of their King, of their Savior, Jesus Christ. And He's getting them ready for the time that He in the flesh will not be with them any longer. And He wants them to know, and He says so, that man can get to me because I'm in flesh and blood and a man. But they can't get to the Holy Spirit. 
He will be with you forever. So let's look further at this Greek word parakletos that we've anglicized the paraclete. It's translated in your versions as Holy Spirit, or I should say translates uh, the idea of comforter, which is again only, you'll see this in a minute, it's only one meaning of the word parakletos that we've anglicized the paraclete. Now this simply comes by examining the Greek lexicons. As far as I know, the Greek lexicons are the highest authority there is. And if we're going to know anything about the original language the Holy Spirit used, you're going to have to consult them. You're going to have to know how they work. So what's the nature of this promised one, this comforter? Well, we see that a parakletos or a paraclete is first of all one called or sent to assist another. So they can expect assistance from the Holy Spirit and the relationship he's going to have with them. One who pleads the cause of another. A monitor, an instructor, a guide, a helper, a supporter, and then our word comforter. So you can see this paraclete relationship with the apostles to enable them to be what God wants them to be, that Christ had been with them because remember he said, I'll send you another comforter. Well, you can't have another if you have the first one. So Christ had been this to them while in the flesh he was with them. But he's leaving. They're going to crucify him. He's going to be buried. He's going to be raised. He's going to go back to heaven. Now what are they going to do? Well, he's going to give them the Holy Spirit. And he's going to have a relationship with them as Jesus had with them. Except he'll be in spirit form and not physically. Now of this paraclete, Jesus says... Whom the world cannot receive. He then says, He dwelleth with you and shall be in you. He shall teach you all things. He shall bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have spoken unto you. And you might emphasize you in all these I'm saying here because that's a reason for understanding this is peculiar to the apostles and nobody else. He shall testify of me. He shall bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have spoken unto you. He shall convict the world of sin. He shall convict the world of righteousness. He shall convict the world of judgment. He shall guide you into all truth. He shall show you things to come. He shall receive of mine and show it unto you. The best way to understand the work of the apostles is to see what the Holy Spirit in the paraclete relationship with the apostles would do. And then you know what the apostles were doing. It was peculiar to their work as ambassadors of the court of heaven. So here we have, uh, I think it's about 11 distinct things that the paraclete is to do for the apostles. Not for the general members of the church. And not for mankind in general. But for the apostles to enable them to do what Jesus called them to do. All of these offices of the paraclete were needed, or they wouldn't have been given to them, by the Lord. Needed by the apostles in their work of giving testimony that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. And that all had to do with establishing the church. They were ignorant and unlearned as far as formal education is concerned. That is, humanly speaking. They could never have gone forth to success and accomplish what the Lord wanted them to do without this supernatural paraclete. They took no thought what they should say. And there was a reason for that, because they didn't need to. It would be given to them in a miraculous way at the proper time. Others, such as yours truly, have to take thought. Sometimes you wonder if you ever give enough thought to some things. But you have to think about it, you have to study it, you have to get it in your mind, you have to reason through it. They didn't have to do that in those cases. The inspired apostle Paul tells, uh, tells um, Timothy to study to show himself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth in 2 Timothy 2.15. And that tells us that the routine matter after the infant stage of the church is over with and the miracles work no more, this would be the way you come to the knowledge of the truth. 
Timothy had to study. He had to study because he did not possess the paraclete. He was not an apostle of Christ. He had a miraculous gift. I don't know what it was. But in that infant stage of the church, without full revelation of the New Testament, Paul told him not to neglect it. It was there for his own benefit. It shows us, too, that the miraculous gifts are used at the will of those who had them. And they could abuse them. Just read 1 Corinthians, and you'll see they were doing it regularly in the church of Corinth. Thus, it took instruction from an apostle, using the powers of the Holy Spirit as an apostle, to teach the people that had hands of apostles laid upon them to have miraculous gifts. All nine of them were listed in 1 Corinthians 12. In order for them to know how the Spirit's gifts should be used. And yet they all had the power to misuse them or abuse them or use them correctly. Timothy then could use that one gift. But he didn't have all of the gifts plus one to lay hands on members of the church and impart a gift to them. 2 Timothy 1.6 tells us what I just said about him having that miraculous gift. Now men today, as you well know, are required to study that they may know what to say. I have heard some people that um, didn't do much study, but they were speaking anyway. And I never will forget the time, and I've used it to illustrations all over the place, where a certain young woman was talking about her confrontation with somebody, and she said, the woman said such and such. And she said, I just didn't know what to say, so I just kept on talking. I think I've run across a number of people like that. A failure to observe this exhortation, that is to study and learn how to study, how the New Testament authorizes, how we come about knowing only what the Bible put into it or what God put in the Bible for us to get out of it and not read anything into it. A failure to observe the excitation of the apostle is the reason that a whole lot of folks, if not all of them, uh, don't know what to say. The paraclete was not only then a comforter, but, and not only an instructor, but he was an infallible guide. He was an infallible guide. And this, I think, is evident from the fact that no apostle ever contradicted another nor said anything foolish. That's interesting. Because the best of us sometimes will make slips of the tongue. You know, if you were listening to an apostle like Peter preached on the day of Pentecost or all the rest of the apostles, or they never made a mistake. Isn't that something? They never, they never made a miscue. They never said the wrong thing. They never gave the wrong scripture. Never did. I never heard a man of today lay claim to being guided into all truth by the Spirit like the apostles were. There are some of them who have taken positions that implied they believed that. I remember Brother Guy Wood saying one time that a fellow was claiming he had the same uh, miraculous gifts that the apostle did, but said he had real bad eyesight. And when he'd be making his speech in the debate, he noticed that he took his reading glasses off and laid them right down here, and Brother Wood was sitting there at his table. He said, I just watched him do that routinely, and... When he began to speak another time and laid his glasses there, I just reached up to his glasses and laid them down here on the table. And when the man went back to read, he couldn't find his glasses and he couldn't read what he wanted to say. So when I got up to speech, to speak my time, I pointed out that if he had what the apostles had, he wouldn't need his glasses at all. He'd be able to write a Bible rather than try to read it, which he can't do without his glasses. Some things just testify that some people just don't have what they claim to have. If any man claims the direct guidance of the Spirit as the apostles could claim and prove, today he cannot consistently deny that same claim to others. But we have all sorts of men and women teaching all sorts of doctrines, often contradicting each other. I always get amazed that you have... If you compare the two, the Mormon doctrine and the doctrines of Muhammad, do you realize that Muhammad was a Latter-day prophet? So was Joe Smith. Muhammad was a Latter-day prophet and produced the Quran. Joseph Smith produced the Book of Mormon. Why don't they both say the same thing? Or anybody else that has a direct hotline to God and you have Mary Baker Glover Patterson Eddie to get all of her husbands in. And she produced 
a direct revelation. But then it's different from those at the Watchtower magazine who claim to have a direct revelation from God and you can't understand the Bible unless you get their two magazines because those people have been anointed and they write in that magazine they'll tell you what this book says. Why don't they all say the same thing? They all claim the same God. And they all claim the same Holy Spirit. Then you've got among the Pentecostal groups, you've got some that are called oneness holiness. That means they only believe there's one being in the Godhead, one person. Then you've got those that believe there's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They all claim direct guidance of the Holy Spirit independent of the Bible. Why don't they teach the same thing? Doesn't the Holy Spirit know who He is? Now when people start that kind of stuff, God gave me common sense to say, one or both of you have to be wrong. And I can read my Bible and understand it claims to present the mind of God to all of us, and it pleads for us to all be one, and it tells us we will be if we'll just follow what the Bible says. So I'm concerned when I want to understand the work of the apostles that I don't just listen to what people say because you see the Mormons also have apostles you may not know that but they do and they claim the same thing these apostles that wrote the Bible by the Holy Spirit claim sometime or another when you may be dealing with them that gives you a great opportunity to point out that those apostles back in the first century that wrote the Bible by the power of the Holy Spirit, they had new revelation. Never been on this earth before. And they proved it was from God and not from men by the miracle signs and wonders. Seems to me if you've got apostles today, they're going to have the same thing those had, and they should be able to do the same thing those did. But they don't. Now, does the Spirit guide a man to preach? Let's say universalism. Nobody's going to be lost. God loves everybody. And eventually, no matter what men do or don't do, he'll save them all. So they preach that up, or another somebody else comes along by the same Holy Spirit, he preaches it down, or whatever you want to call it. And the same is true when you've got Calvinism teaching one set of doctrine, you've got Mormonism, you've got whatever, any other isms out there, and they're all contradicting one another. The only sad part about it is nowadays we've reached a stage in denominationalism and throughout the modern religions claiming Christ as Savior, even claiming the Holy Spirit. They don't really know much about what they believe about the specifics of these doctrines, and thus they just preach love, sweet love, look at God, know you can't save yourself, God will through Christ save you, nothing you can do to save yourself, just acknowledge that and go right on and do anything else you want to. Just don't sin too much. That's basically what's going on nowadays in denominationalism. You can sort of touch sin now and then. Just don't grab hold of it and hang on. If you look round about you at most of what's out there that claims to be Christian, that's pretty much what a lot of them are saying. In fact, it covers all your community churches. And that's the reason they've had such a growth in our materialistic world. They don't really require much at all for you to give up or take on. They just say, acknowledge your lost condition and God loves you and Jesus is your Savior. Call Him into your heart and go right on. About anything you want to dedicate to God, then they'll say God accepts it. It's a sad situation, but the Holy Spirit never revealed anything like that. And all it takes is a study of the last will and testament of the Christ, the sword of the Spirit, Ephesians 6, 17, to see that's not the case. Now this teaching places the Holy Spirit in a, in a very unenviable position. That of preaching a lot of things that are just as wrong as they can be. Because you'll have all sorts of doctrines, as I just mentioned. And they'll be, well, just think of the doctrines that are preached within a mile of where we are. Think of how many. If you can just think of these different churches, they're all going to be teaching different things. Now, suppose that me being one preacher were to tell you, you don't have to be baptized to be saved. That's one sermon. But let, let me tell you my other sermon. You do have to be baptized to be saved. And another sermon says you can use any kind of mechanical instruments or music and worship you want to. And the other one says, no, you'll go to hell if you do it. And every Sunday I'm preaching like that. And you say, that's terrible. It must not be. They're doing it all around us all the time. And all of them claiming God is their Father and Christ is their Savior and the Holy Spirit leading them into it. It sort of reminds me of the old African chief 
that believed in polygamy and missionaries came there and taught him you could only have one wife. He couldn't figure it out. He says, well, I don't understand how we're that different from Americans. We have them all at once. You have them one at a time. And really, there isn't, is it? Well, I think a preacher doing this, even in this crazy stage of things, it ruined his reputation. Although, when I think of Joel Osteen, I don't know that anything can ruin anybody's reputation. And I mean that kindly. Because that man will not say anybody's lost. But he'll tell you what they do to be saved. Now think about that for a minute. Nobody's lost, but you need to be saved. Saved from what if you're not lost? And it's the health and wealth preaching. And the Holy Spirit's guiding him to say all that. There's just something wrong. And that something is to apply to the world the promise of the paraclete, which was only given to the apostles for them to do what they did. And that was received from heaven, fundamentally the word of truth that is the New Testament, the apostles' doctrine, and to be comforted and strengthened miraculously while they were on this earth to bear up under the terrible persecution they underwent so that they could get the truth of this world. Paul told Timothy, The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. 2 Timothy 2.2 2. You know, any apostle could say that to anybody else that was a disciple and wanted to be a preacher of the gospel? That would, if you take the view of some people, was that not an impertinence in Paul if Timothy had the same divine leading as he? Well, he didn't, did he? Was it not impertinence in Jude to say that the faith was once for all delivered to the saints? Jude 3, if there were deliverances being constantly made? What need to preach the gospel to the heathen world if God is directly leading men into all truth? What need for a New Testament if all men possess this paraclete association that Jesus promised only to the apostles? How can one man deny the claims of another whom he admits to be divinely guided into all truth? And that's where a lot of denominations find themselves. Some have thought that Christ bestowed the paraclete upon the apostles when he breathed, you'll remember, breathed upon them and said, Receive ye the Holy Spirit. Well, at very best, that was prophetic and not an actual bestowal. For after this out on breathing, we start to say out breathing, this on breathing, we find Peter, Acts chapter 1, calling upon the assembly of brethren to take a vote as to who should succeed Judas in the apostolic college. You would need to do that if you had the paraclete already relationship, the Holy Spirit, with the apostles. If he had possessed the paraclete at that time, he would not have called upon a vote from all those people gathered there to pick another apostle to take Judas Iscariot's place. Moreover, Christ indicated when the paraclete would come, by stating the work that would follow when he did come. When he is come, Jesus said, he shall convict the world or that age, world you know comes from a Greek word meaning age, of sin, that's one thing he'll do, of righteousness and of judgment. The question is, how did he do this? Because that's the work of the paraclete, part of it, with the apostles of Christ. And it tells us something of the work of the apostles. First of, all, uh, first of all, his first act at his coming was to baptize the apostles in the Spirit. Well, the Spirit's a person. You can't put somebody in a person, even a supernatural person. It is simply a way of saying he shall baptize you in power. And in so doing, he would endow then this Holy Spirit relationship that we've been talking about that's peculiar to parakletos or paraclete. Ye shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days hence. Acts 1.5. And he never said that to everybody. He said to the apostles regarding their work. When the, number two, when the Spirit baptized these apostles with divine guidance, he began his work of convicting that age or that world uh, through them. Now, note this in your study of the Bible. There is not a case in the New Testament where the Holy Spirit ever made an issue with a man to personally and directly convict him of sin. You can't find it. It's not there. As many denominations teach, all men are convicted of sin 
by the Holy Spirit. Nobody denies that. But how does the Spirit do it? The Holy Spirit working through the preached word of the Spirit fill men. That's exactly how they did it. Isn't it interesting that in the days of miracles, it was still the word that had to be heard and understood, believed and obeyed? That's part of what we're trying to show on Sunday morning on this whole series on the word of reconciliation. And he, when he has come, Jesus said to the apostles, will convict the world. That, I think, is the Jewish world, the Jewish age, in respect of sin because they believe not on me. Now look at the Jews in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Look at what it says about them when Jesus went about them. I'm speaking in, in general. They called him a blasphemer. They said he was possessed of devils. They rejected him. All these things they said about him. They then took him, as Peter declared to them in the first recorded gospel sermon in Acts 2 on Pentecost, the church was established, and with wicked hands, crucify and slew him. And the first thrust of the Holy Spirit through the apostles via the word preached on the day of Pentecost was at this sinful act of the world, specifically the Jewish world. Remember, crucify him, crucify him, let his blood be upon us and upon our children. Peter declared to them, this same Jesus whom ye crucified with wicked hands, slew, killed, murdered, God hath raised him up and made him both Lord and Christ. And if you go over to Acts 3 in the second recorded gospel sermon, Peter preached it too, he'll do the same thing again. And the council knew what he was doing. Because they said, you're, you're trying to lay this man's blood upon us. They got the message. And who wouldn't when it was said as plain as those preachers preached then, which is, again, somewhat different from a lot of preachers today. One elder said one time, we've got a preacher. Said he never does throw fastballs. He just winds up and throws a curveball around the whole congregation. Also, the paraclete relationship of the Holy Spirit with the apostles that he would convict of righteousness Jesus said, because I go to the Father and ye behold me no more. Now if this passage teaches that men are individually convicted of sin, it also teaches that they're individually convicted of righteousness. And this would be a tremendous task. It's a contradiction of terms actually to say that the Spirit convicts man of sin. Then in the very next breath that he convicts the same man of righteousness. And yet the Spirit was to convict men, the Scripture says so, in plain words of righteousness. But the question needs to be asked, whose righteousness? And I answered the righteousness of Jesus Christ because the Jews said He wasn't. Of righteousness, Jesus said, because I go to the Father and you behold me no more. When Jesus walked this earth as a man, just like we walk the earth, He stated that He was the Son of God. He claimed to come down from heaven. He claimed to manifest God in the flesh. But at the same time, the Scripture says of Him that He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Also, that there was no beauty that we should desire Him. Makes me wonder the, <laughs> about the artist when they decide to paint Him. Because that's not what you see in the paintings. Well, on this account, you'll remember that the Jews refused to accept him as a son of God. They simply denied his claim to deity. They said he blasphemed when he said that. So much so that the high priest tore his garments in the way that the eastern people did to show great uh, sorrow and distaste and rejection of a thing they considered to be bad or hurtful. And they called him a blasphemer for making himself, they said, equal with God. Because you see, in the Jewish mind, when you said son of so-and-so, that made you equal with that person. So to say that he's son of God meant he was God. And they didn't tolerate that. They believed that he was unrighteous in making that claim. And Jesus died because his claims were not accepted by his own people. But now, after his death, 
his resurrection, he is crowned with glory and honor at the right hand of the Almighty. So Peter declared him ruling on that first Pentecost, the day the church started. Said that he was right at the right hand of the majesty on high. And you know the Holy Spirit came on the apostles as the ambassadors of the court of heaven in the foundation of the church itself to demonstrate the righteous claims that Jesus made while on earth. The Holy Spirit came to convict men of the righteousness of Jesus Christ and not their own righteousness. And that's a very important point because the Jews, remember, said, uh, we have Abraham, our father, by physical birth. And that confused Nicodemus in John 3. We are acceptable to God. We are righteous. Jesus was saying all along, that won't cut it. In fact, did John the baptizer, the one that prepared the Jews to receive the Christ, said, say not to yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. For God can of these stones raise up children to Abraham. All that was saying, you can't trust in yourself being born a descendant of Abraham through Jacob and, and Israelite. That won't cut it anymore. You don't understand what your nation was all about nor the design and purpose of the law of Moses. And as Paul would declare, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Then, too, the Holy Spirit, working through the apostles, would convict the world of judgment. And he says, because the prince of this world is judged. Now, this may go a little bit against the grain of some folks as to what the prince, who the prince of this world is. The passage doesn't say, as many preachers quote it, that he's going to uh, convict the world of judgment to come, go back and read it, it doesn't say that. But it does say of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. This scripture is often quoted to show that a judgment was pronounced upon Satan. Well, folks, Satan had judgment pronounced on him a long time before this. And, and they say that because he's often called the prince of this world. Well, I realize there's a sense which you can say that, but is that what he's talking about right here? The word for prince in the original is used 37 times. 32 times, it clearly means an earthly ruler. And five times, it may apply to Satan. There's no reason why the expression, the prince of this world, may not mean an earthly ruler. I think it refers directly to Pontius Pilate in John 14, 30, when Jesus said, The prince of this world comes, and he hath nothing in me. Pilate justifies that statement when he says, and you already know what he said, to the Jews trying to get out of having to pronounce death on him, I find no fault in this man. Now, if this man ever told the truth, he told it then. And yet he would ask and did ask of Jesus, what is truth? And yet, why did he say that? Because he knew to please the Jews, all he had to do was kill them. But he couldn't find anything in the man worthy of death and said so. But he was a politician, first and foremost, and always. And thus he went ahead and rather than cause trouble between Rome and him, and the Jews could do it, because they said, you know, anybody that calls him, he's not a friend of Caesar. And that scared Pilate to his core. And so he let them do as they please, but he put on a big demonstration of washing his hands. So I, I'm free of this matter. I have nothing to do with it. You take and do with him as you will. Nevertheless, as prince of this world, he pronounced, because they couldn't do it without wrong approval, the death sentence and delivered Jesus Christ up to be crucified. This was... Literally and actually, the judgment of the prince of this world that Jesus called the prince of this world. But the descent of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost reversed this judgment and pronounced the righteous judgment in its place, thus judging Pilate, the prince of this world. And so it did. I think you see that even if you don't agree with that, it would certainly not change the things what one must be do to be saved. But I think it does give a closer understanding of exactly how that's used by Jesus when he said, here's what the Holy Spirit would do. 
And on the very first time that he preached, that's what he said. That is Peter and the other apostles. For Peter stood up with the eleven. And they preached the word of God. Now these three previously noted things accomplished on the Pentecost when the Spirit came should cause us to sit up and take notice in view of the fact what Jesus promised, uh, who Jesus promised the Spirit to and how the Spirit worked when He came upon them and what He actually did in that sermon. You can see every one of those three things the Holy Spirit was supposed to do made clear in that one sermon. And that tells me a whole lot of just how they preached to the Jews in that day and time. And if you look at the second sermon, you'll see the same thing. And if you look at Stephen's sermon, you'll see the same thing. The Jews were convicted of sin and rejected in crucifying Christ. They were also convicted of the righteousness of Christ in claiming to be the Son of God. And likewise convinced that God had raised up Jesus and made Him both, as Peter announced, Lord and Christ. In accomplishing this work, the Spirit did it through the instrumentality of gospel preaching. And all subsequent convictions of sin of righteousness and of judgment have been accomplished through the same agency and will be till the end of time. Thus, if you want to become a Christian, you must understand the gospel. If you want to understand what sin is that separates you from God, you must understand the gospel. If you want to understand what righteousness is, listen and understand the gospel. If you want to understand who's judged, listen and understand the gospel. The paraclete continued with the apostles how long? Forever. Till the end of their work. And he continued to guide them and to lead them and to show them things to come until that which was perfect has come, which is the perfect law of liberty, the completed New Testament. And thus we have it. And to do that, he had to bring them to remembrance all things he had said and guide them into all truth. So under the direct and supernatural control, the apostles of Jesus Christ preached the gospel to all the nations of the earth. And by the time that the letter of the Colossians was written, Paul could say, we have done what Christ in the Great Commission said we needed to do. It has been preached. He says it twice in the first chapter of Colossians. They did what the apostles had to do. They wrote the epistles to the churches and gave to mankind the New Testament. And those that weren't apostles that wrote part of the New Testament did so under the guidance of the Spirit through the prophetic office they received by the laying on of hands. That's how James wrote. That's how Luke wrote. That's how Mark wrote. That's how Jude wrote. They wrote the perfect law of liberty. So the Holy Spirit was involved in giving us the mind of Christ in the New Testament, yet it's His sword. So the work of the paraclete being finished and his mission ended. No man has been guided, shown, and directed personally and directly by him since. God does not do unnecessary work. And the work of the paraclete is not necessary now and hasn't been since he finished the revelation of his will proved it by miracle signs and wonders to be from God, and set it down in the divine volume. Listen now to Ephesians 4, beginning verse 8 and going, well, starting also 11 through 13, or going through those verses. Listen to what Paul said about this. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, and gave gifts unto men. And he gave some to be apostles, and some prophets, and to some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now why? For the perfecting of the saints, under the work of ministry, under the building up of the body of Christ. How long does this take place? Till we all attain to the unity of the faith. It didn't say the unity of all people <laughs> believing exactly the same thing. It says unity of the faith. The unity of the system of faith. The same faith that you said we're to contend for. He's talking about the unity, the whole New Testament, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a full-grown man under the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I've said often, and you've heard me say it, Paul never held a completed New Testament in his hand. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us toward the end of it, he yearned for that day. In fact, he was teaching on the end and the design of miracles. And he said those things were part and parcel. 
He looked for the day of the perfect coming, which would be the full revelation of God's will, when we would need what so many people claim they'd like to have today, and that would be miracles. What we need is what we have, the New Testament of Jesus Christ. Our Lord knew that, for He said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him the last day. Fundamentally speaking, the apostles were to write the New Testament of the Christ. Everything else that was going on with them as far as the Paracletus, the Paraclete relationship with them was all involved in their personal needs as human beings having to do this tremendous task. Fundamentally, and you'll read it in John 14, 15, and 16, the Spirit is the Spirit of truth indicating the full reason that he was revealing the mind of God. And doesn't that harken back to Jesus? If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And Paul said to Timothy, preach the word. We have all we need that pertains to life and godliness in the New Testament. It's up to us now, God done his part that we could never do for ourselves, to study that book, meditate on it day and night, and learn the will of heaven, and then with all the power we have within us, render obedience to it and never stop. That's the way it's right, it can't be wrong, and it'll get you to heaven. As far as I know, nothing else will. If you're subject to the call of Jesus, we invite you to obey the gospel this evening. By being baptized into Jesus Christ. Or as a Christian, if you sin, come repenting of those sins, confessing them, and praying God for forgiveness. Are you subject to the blessed message and invitation of our Lord? If so, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.